we could get some of the lights back on and then uh, we'll be good. I'm reminded of the Chinese word for crisis. It's composed of two different letters. Uh, one means danger, the other means opportunity. And in every crisis, there is danger, but there is also an opportunity to do something great. In the midst of all of the things that we are going through in our world, when it's dark, the gospel shines the brightest. and We're able to accomplish the most good for the master. And that's, that's why we're here, right? As this is an exciting time to be alive uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I am particularly blessed by the Lord um, because like you, uh, he chose to save me. Uh, he didn't have to, he chose to, he wanted to. It brought him good pleasure to save me as well as you. And I rejoice in that fact. And all of the other things that have come about in my life are just ancillary blessings <laughs> uh, that come behind that one. Um, I am uh, just greatly um, blessed by the Lord uh, in a wonderful, wonderful way. And I don't take those things for granted. Thank you all for uh, praying for my daughter. And uh, most of you, if not all of you know, that uh, she delivered uh, our second grandchild yesterday. Um, I told her that she would probably, since she didn't choose to deliver the baby on my off week, last week, I said, you'll probably have it on the day that I'm working all day, which was Thursday. And she called me Thursday morning and she said, well, dad, I guess you were right. Looks like the baby's gonna come today. I'm like, oh, thank you, <laughs> but okay. But of course the baby uh, was patient and waited until Friday uh, just for me. <laughs> Uh, so that I could go down there with the and keep Ishmael. Um, when she had the baby, um, her blood pressure was up. And ladies, you know, sometimes your blood pressure is up when you are toward the latter part of your pregnancy. And of course, after she delivered the baby, her blood pressure was still up. So they chose to keep her overnight, additionally for observation. So we were praying, my wife and I were praying last night together. and. Um, you know, the Lord is gracious. This morning, uh, she texted me and said, okay, her blood pressure went down. So they said she'll be able to come home today. You know? That's good because I bought a little celebration dessert that I was looking forward to eating today. You know, um, So that's all well and good. But anyway, praise the Lord for that uh, as well. Uh, thank you for praying. And uh, thank the Lord for his graciousness. Um, well, at this time, we're going to turn our attention uh, to something way more important, the book of Ephesians, uh, as we've been working our way through chapter four. Uh, we will probably finish the chapter before the millennium, I mean, uh, before the Lord returns, unless, of course, he comes in the next 35 minutes. But um, we are on track to uh, tease it out and <laughs> maybe uh, by the end of this month. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we are looking at, on the next slide, I put the verses that we looked at last week. Uh, I highlighted, uh, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his hands, his own hands. Instead of stealing somebody else's stuff, he's performed with his own hands what is good so that he will, he may, he will have something to share with the one who has need. And so last week, we looked at uh, the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal, and the prohibitions therein. Uh, four gloves that will tear down that steel fence so you can stop stealing. And we were able to tease out uh, some of those things this morning. I would like for us then uh, to look at the very next verse, which is verse 29. Uh, this is a very challenging verse. Uh, for all of us, um, some more so than others, it says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only that 
Only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. The words are very, very important to God. In fact, um, I find it fascinating. I remember uh, years ago uh, doing a Bible study out of John 1. In the beginning was the word. And I said, look, of all the ways that God could have described his, his son, he described him as the word which tells us that God is very interested in communicating something significant to us. He communicated his love. He communicated his, his uh, compassion. He communicated his disgust for sin. He communicated his will to us using words. And of course, the writer of Hebrews said that uh, in old times, God, he spoke in visions and dreams and in prophetic utterances to prophets. But in these last days, he summed it all up. The last thing that God wanted to say to us, he said in his son. Jesus Christ called the living word of God. God is very, very interested in words, and they are not to be taken for granted. There is a word called wordsmith. I like that word, not because the smith is in it, but wordsmithing is the process of becoming very skillful in the use of words, because words are very, very important. Words build up, words tear down, and words are not casual. In fact, the scripture says every word of God is perfect. God never wastes words. He chooses his words very carefully. And in his choosing, he picks words that will accurately express and convey his will, he communicates with us, he gives us word pictures and images and directives using the medium of words. And so, because God cares a lot about words, guess what? It does not surprise us that his son is called the word of God. And because Christ is the word of God, then it makes sense, does it not, that those who are little Christs, that's what Christian means, right? Little Christ. Then we will be very, very interested in the use of words. So we will be very, very careful about the words that we use. And that's what the scriptures are telling us here in Ephesians chapter 4. Wordsmithing, I hope that all of us become very, very adept at doing that. You ought to. If you're not good with words, I just want to say to you in a kind way, get good, because words are very, very important. Four things uh, in this passage that we want to look at just for a couple of minutes, and then, uh, as they say, we are out of here. Number one, I want us to understand that words have power. Words have power. Now, I don't, I don't mean that words have ex nihilo power. You know, God is able to speak into existence using words, that which does not exist, you know, God is able to take nothing and make something out of it. You don't have the power, okay? You don't have any kind of superpower to make stuff happen. Now, uh, you know, there is uh, some people, you know, they say things, you know, they're part of that name and acclaimant genre where they say, well, you know, you, if you speak it, it'll come to pass. So they say, well, I'm not claiming any kind of sickness, <coughs> right? Because if I claim it, it'll come about. You don't have ex nihilo power. Your words don't cre create sickness, just like they don't create health. However, your words are significant in that your words are able to present a mindset that people can gravitate toward. Your words are able to build people up. Your words are able to motivate people. Your, your words are actually able to change the direction of a life. Words do have power. And so we want to think about how important words are. In fact, the scriptures say a lot about that. I gave you some verses here. Uh, uh, Psalm 143, God, the writer Mo, uh, Paul, uh, David, he said, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I need to close the door sometimes because 
you know, if you speak too, want too long, too loudly, uh, eventually you're going to say the wrong thing. And that's what the writer says. Proverbs 13.3, he says, those who control their tongue <laughs> will have a long life. Because if you waggle your tongue, somebody might cut your life short because you might say the wrong thing. I have a friend, uh, Aaron Lavender, he says he was driving down the road and um, he pulled up to the red light and there was one of these young people who feel that it is their calling in life to share their music with everybody in the whole neighborhood. And he's blasting that stuff. And of course, he's playing this vulgar rap with all of the lyrics, calling women all kinds of names. And he said, my first mindset was to let my window down and say, fool, turn that down. But he said, well, you, you know, it ain't safe doing stuff like that. So he said, I left my window up and I just waited for the light to turn green so I could get away from that. You know, sometimes you, you have to be careful with the words that you say because sometimes words have the ability to come back at you in the form of violence. Proverbs 18.21 makes the point, those who love to talk will experience the consequences. That's their way of saying that the more you say, the more you increase the likelihood that you're going to say the wrong thing. So don't say a whole lot because eventually something's gonna come out that ought not to come out. The tongue can kill or nourish life. James 3, James makes the point, we all make many mistakes, but those, those who control their tongues can control themselves. See, the hardest thing to control in your life is your tongue. Now, Listen, when I got saved, all of me got saved. All of me. My mind got saved. My hands got saved. My feet got saved. Listen, my mouth got saved too. Because my mouth got saved, I had to change some of the things that came out of my mouth. God gives me the grace, the strength to control what goes on and what comes out of my mouth. James chapter three, verses five through eight. I put those verses down because I want us to, to think about the power of speech. He says, so also the tongue, the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. Your tongue can do a whole lot of damage. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is full of wickedness. I said, you might say, well, my, no, my, not my tongue. Yes, your tongue. Because listen, your tongue reveals what's in your heart. And you know what's in your heart? The scripture describes it. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You say, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, you did. You know what comes out of your mouth. It comes from your heart. He says, it is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. Now, you ought to consider the fact that, listen, if I say the wrong thing, my whole life gets altered and can bring about absolute ruin. I can say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time, and that thing will carry me in a compromised condition for the rest of my life. Words are very, very important. And so, as an emerging wordsmith, I want to become very adept at using words skillfully. Kayla Laird uh, was visiting my wife and I uh, shortly before uh, she uh, was, well, she was telling us how that they had, she was being pulled in a different direction. And so she came in and, you know, uh, she was sharing a whole lot of things uh, as Kayla does, but she said, she said, Pastor Ray, I just, you, you one of those people, you know, you don't, you don't say a whole lot, but see, when you talk, he said, she says, you, you just tend to, you tend to speak really slowly. It's like, like you're choosing the right words to say, but then when you say something, it's really, really profound. And I said, well, I'm not trying to be profound. I'm just trying to make sure that what I say is the right thing. I, I don't want to speak haphazardly, because I want to be like God. 
Every word that God speaks is precise. He chooses his words carefully. And so I just want to make sure that I choose the right words. I don't want to waste words. I want to use them correctly. And so I speak slowly. Drives my wife crazy because she says, it takes you so long. Just say what you're going to say. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but I want to say the right thing. And that just takes time. I realize the power of the tongue. He says it can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. Only God can do that. I need to be careful that I allow God full access to my heart so that he can control by his spirit my tongue. I don't want to say the wrong thing. He says it is an uncontrollable evil full of deadly poison. And so I, I want to be careful with my words. And I, I, I'm not always good at it, but I'm trying to get better always at it. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for allowing us just a few minutes to hear your voice. Father, we want to learn from you how to traffic in words, because that's what you do. You are so articulate. You have communicated to us in an incredible way your love for us using your word. You sent your word to rescue us. You sent your word to heal us. You sent your word to guide us. And Father, we will be absolutely lost without your word, both the written word and, of course, our wonderful example and deliverer, the living word, our Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we want to just take a moment to just praise you and to thank you and to adore you. Thank you for being that word that we needed. And our deliverer, you are awesome in all your ways. Direct us now as we seek to gain a greater ascendancy by your spirit uh, through the power of the preached word to become more like you in character. We ask in your name. Amen. Paul mentions three things here about words that I want us to consider. First of all, he talks about prohibited words, prohibited words. He said, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. That, that word, uh, sapra, is unwholesome. It, it, it's a word that's used to describe uh, rotting fruit and vegetables, rotting fish. You, you know how sometimes you, you go and you look and you, you, you reach for that apple and you see it's soft and brown and it's rotting, perhaps has worms or maggots in it because flies have laid their eggs. You know, uh, perhaps... Uh, like me, you left the fish out uh, overnight and it's spoiled and it's rotting and it emits an odor. That's the word he uses to describe the words. He says, don't let unwholesome, don't let rotten, decrepit, nasty words come out of your mouth. I thought, well, what kind of words are prohibited? So I put it, now this is not an exhaustive list. Obviously, but I put a few things. Okay, off-color jokes. Listen, as Christians who are little Christs, then we ought to only speak in a way that brings glory to Christ and that patterned after the likeness of Christ. So off-color jokes really wouldn't be fitting in our mouths. Profanity. I don't care how angry you get. Be angry and what? Don't sin. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Don't say the wrong thing, right? Profanity ought never come out of the mouth of a Christian because profanity ought never be in the heart of a Christian. If it's not in the heart, it can't come out of the mouth. And see, if you listen to that stuff all day on television and on the radio and in the music and all that stuff, it saturates your thinking it gets down into your heart and it'll come up out of your mouth before you know it. See? You have to listen to pure words, clean words, dirty stories. I was going to work one time um, and you know, this was years ago. I worked in Atlanta 
and there were some guys sitting in a row, you know, the, the, the winos, they sat in front of the grocery store there, and they had nothing else to do but sit around drinking and talking smack. And they knew me because I, I came up all the time and, hey, pre, uh, t, uh, they call me Doc. Hey, Doc, listen. And, and they proceeded to tell me a story. Now, whenever people want to just tell you a story off the cuff, usually it ain't, ain't something you want to listen to. It's usually pretty raunchy. And, and it was. I don't even remember how bad it was, but I just know, I was like, okay, I know where he's going with this. And so he ran down his little litany, and then I just walked away. And later on, he came into the store and he walked up to the counter. He said, he said, that, that, that joke offended you, didn't it? I said, well, listen, that's, that's, not, that's not my lifestyle. Um, before I was a Christian, something like that might have been something that came out of my mouth. But that's, that's not me anymore. I'm not really interested in that kind of speech anymore. And he said, you know what, I'm sorry. And I found that a lot of times people, they, they want to tell you a story because they think it's going to make you laugh. But then when they realize, oh, look, they're not wired that way. They say, I, you know, that joke didn't do any good. It did more harm than good. And many times they'll apologize. Not all of them, but eventually they'll stop telling you dirty stories if you don't respond to them. Okay, and vulgarity, you know, same kind of raunchy mess, right? Double entendre. Double entendre is, is you know, when, when things can go in two different directions. You know, usually when it's a double entendre, they do this a lot on television. You know, it drives you crazy. But, well, maybe, maybe not. But, uh, for instance, uh, the guy goes up to the fruit stand, and the woman is standing there to sell the fruit. And he said, man, those are some really big melons you have there. Uh, can I see one? And she says, excuse me? He says, yeah, they're for sale, right? She said, oh, oh, well, sure, right? See, her thinking was he's talking about something else. Now, see, the joke is, oh, she thinks he's talking about her. You know, those are double entendres. And you see, and on television, they used to have a TV show called The Office. They did that all the time. Everything in that show was about sex, sexual innuendo. <clears throat> Listen, Christians ought never to use double entendres. It's not wholesome, it's only unwholesome. You know, Bill Gothard says, and I, I put it up in its own little slide, and I've said it before, and I want us to really get it down. Listen, the tongue is a daily reminder to purify my heart. Because if, if it's not, if my heart isn't pure, my mouth is going to reveal it. And so when I say something off color, when I say something indiscreet, when I say something that's wrong, then I need to think, okay, now see, my heart isn't right before God. Because God looks not on the outward appearance, God looks right at the heart. And if my heart isn't right and my mouth reveals that my heart isn't right, that's what God sees. And so I want to confess my sin and get right with him. I want to keep short accounts with God. Paul says, don't let unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth. It's just not fitting. But that's enough. He says, he says there are also profitable words, profitable words. <clears throat> he says, what should come out? If it should, if it's not, shouldn't be unwholesome, then what should it be? He says, well, they should be profitable in this sense. He says, only, that means that there needs to be a limit on what comes out. You know, I, I said uh, last week, two ears, one mouth, right? Listen twice as much as you speak. I was taking, take, I was at a seminar Wednesday, and we had to take blood pressure using an old manual blood pressure cuff where you put it around the arm and you squeeze the little gauge there and it pumps it up. And then you, you release it just a little bit at a time to let the, the pressure go down until it thumps, you know. And, so, and I, you know, I was doing, taking the brothers, the guy's blood pressure, and I was just thinking, you know, wow, you know, you have a lot of pressure in there, and you just let it out a little bit at a time. You don't let it all out at once because you don't get an accurate reading. Sometimes, instead of just saying a whole lot of stuff, you ought to just let a little bit out at a time. 
the scripture says in Proverbs, he who has knowledge spares his words. He doesn't say a whole lot. You know, you know smart people don't do a lot of talking. You ever notice that? Uh, like the farmer was saying he was going down the road and this old uh, guy thought he, was, he knew everything about everything. He was just yapping the whole time. The farmer said to him, he said, he said you look out of the field there and look at the corn. He said, you notice that only the empty heads stand up. You know, the full ones, they are bent over low. The empty ones stand up and to be seen first of all, right? And sometimes that's how it is. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. The greatest uh, voice that we want to hear is our own. And so we just, you know. Listen, the one who knows a lot doesn't have to say a lot. Uh, because many times they know the power of words, right? And so they limit their words. I was, my wife and I, she's not here to, to give me permission to do this. So I'm going to take the permission. <laughs> uh, but, you know, she and I had a, a conversation uh, not long ago. Um, she was a little exercised about something that she expected to happen that didn't happen. And so she came in and she vented and she said something to me that I thought was extremely unfair. And so she asked me, are you going to, and, and you know, I just said, I, I don't know. And I just kind of just went on and do something else because I knew when I didn't give her the response, then she would get angry and walk away, which she did. And so, you know, at the time she said that, it hurt my feelings. And I, I didn't want to respond in anger because, I mean, I just preached a sermon that said, be angry at no sin. <laughs> so I, I put it off. But like I said to you before, you have to resolve the conflict. If you let the conflict go, then, you know, Satan hops on your shoulder and gives you reasons why it was worse than it is, and it turns to bitterness, and bitterness poisons all of your energy. And I didn't want anything like that to happen. And so, you know, I, I didn't say anything to her at the time because I really wasn't wanting to, to, to just speak exactly how I felt. That was not the right time to do it. So I waited um, and I processed it. And later on, I went to her and I said, can we talk? I said, we need to talk. But that would have been the wrong thing. I said, can we talk? And I sat there and I waited for her to stop what she was doing. And she looked up and I said, listen, when you said what you said the other day, it really hurt me, you know? And, and because this is what I was facing. And then I tried to choose words that would communicate to her exactly what I was feeling and what I thought. You know, you want to paint word pictures because you want people to understand what you're saying. You don't want to just say stuff to get it off your chest. You want to communicate. And so you have to choose the words that would allow you to communicate. And so I, I chose words that I thought would explain to her exactly how I felt. And, and she did get it. She said, oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. This was what I was thinking. And then she could explain her view, which I pretty much understood because I processed it. Okay, she's looking at it this way. And that's why she said what she said. And so when she explained her view, and I said, well, I understand that you feel this way because this, 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 it's just that when you said that, it threw out all the things that I had done, which made me feel unappreciated. And you know, we were able to talk that thing through and get a result. It didn't take long, but it was something that just needed to happen. So I mentioned that because, see, sometimes, you know, you think words are unimportant. It doesn't matter. If I'm angry and I vent and I blow you away, I feel better. No, you don't. And not only do you not feel better, but what you do is you hurt the person, you set the person up, and you put them in prison. You do realize that if you say something that really hurts someone, that all of the emotions that's tied to the moment, as often as they think about the event, all of the emotions travel with it and come right back. 
And so what you've done, you set them up so Satan can punish them again and again and again and again. And they can never get free from that. And you don't want to do that to people. That's not loving. So you don't let the thing linger. You get a resolve. Because you want to be out of prison and you want to let them out of prison. You don't want Satan to gain advantage over you or them. And as an act of love, you got to get a resolve. So you choose the words. Profitable words are important. Profitable words, Paul says, only speak what's good for the use of edification. If it doesn't build up, don't say it. You say, well, I just had to get it off my chest. No, you didn't. The inappropriate words can paint an entirely wrong picture of people. You know, there was a couple getting married and the, the woman was very, very nervous. And the pastor understood that. And so he said to the best man, he said, listen, before, you know, at this point in the ceremony, I want you to read 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. He says, I want to be able to encourage the woman because I know she's fearful. What he didn't know was that the best man wasn't a believer and didn't know a lot about the Bible. So what he did is he found the Bible, he opened it, and he said, the preacher wanted me to share something for the bride, and he's going to comment on it later. He opened it, and he read John 4.18, which says, you've had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. And he closed it up. <laughs> he thought it would be an encouraging thing, but it wasn't encouraging because the situation wasn't appropriate. Listen, you want to choose the right word at the right time to have the right effect. Paul says only choose words that are going to build people up, not tear them down. He says, they're also, profitable words are specifically chosen. He says, uh, according to the need of the moment, the, word of, the words of the moment are in italics because that's not in the Greek. It says, according to the need. The word need there is an interesting word because it's a word that's used to speak of debt or, or someone who works to pay off a debt. And, you know, I think Paul's mindset here is that, listen, just as when you have something to get done, you put someone to work for you to get it done, you know, they pay off the debt by working for you, so you ought to put your words to work. What you need to do, you need to choose the words that will accomplish the effect, the result that you want to accomplish. So you don't just choose anybody to do anything. You choose the people that are most appropriate to get the work done. Not everybody's good at everything. So if you have a task that needs someone who's friendly, you don't put a grouse up there. If you have a task that requires an amount of skill, you know, there was a, a church they were remodeling, and they asked for volunteers and said, come to the church and help tear down this old room and the, the wall and everything. They had a lot of renovation to do. And he said about 40, 50 people showed up, and all they had to do was get a hammer and a foot and, and, and some, uh, you know, just knock things down. All they had to do was destroy things. He said, oh, but after they destroyed it and we cleaned everything up, now they needed to build. Now he said, I didn't, there wasn't 40 or 50 people doing that. Only a few people are skillful enough to go and build what needs to be built. Doesn't take much at all. It doesn't take any skill to tear down, but it takes a lot of skill to build up. And it's like that with words. Listen, it doesn't take many words at all to tear something down. Oh, but words have to be carefully chosen if they're going to build something up, if they're going to turn things around. So I don't want to just say whatever. I want to choose words carefully that will convey exactly what I want to convey. You do understand that there are four levels of communication. When I do marriage counseling, I put a little uh, visual together to explain this to the prospective couple. I say, listen, this is what you say. 
And then there's what you meant to say. They may not be the same thing. And there's what they heard and what they think they heard. They may not be the same thing. So you got to choose the words that would effectively communicate exactly what you mean to say in such a way that they will understand exactly what it is you're trying to say. That's why you say, well, tell me what I said. Or, you know, and get some feedback from them because they might be way off base. And you want to understand. You say, well, Pastor, that's a lot of work. Of course it is. That's why a lot of people don't become adept at communicating, because they don't want to put the work in. But if you're going to be good at it, you have to work at it. You say, well, maybe I don't want to be good at it. Yeah, you do, because you're a follower of Christ. And because you're a follower of Christ, and because the scripture says that you ought to be imitators of God, right, as dear children, if you want to imitate God, and God traffics in words, God chooses words, God designs everything he wants to say in such a way to communicate exactly what he wants communicated, then those who follow him should think like that. Words are very important. God forbid that we traffic in them in an irreverent way. But it's a payoff. There's a payoff. What's the payoff for using good words? Well, Paul says this, so that. This is what happens when you choose the right word. Instead of using unwholesome words, in, instead of using a whole bunch of words that don't mean a lot, when you carefully choose the right word, then you can have a beneficial effect. He says, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now just think, every time I speak, there ought to be grace extended. Somebody should be benefiting from the words that I speak, or maybe I just are not saying that. I love Isaiah 50, verse 4. Uh, this, is a, this is Isaiah speaking the words that are true of Christ, of course. He says, the Lord has given me the tongue of disciples. He says, that I may know how to sustain the weary one. How? With the word. There, there is a way to speak in such a way that it takes a person who is weary and builds them up with strength. It gives them motivation. It pumps them up so that they want to achieve. My oldest son was a little kid. Uh, he used to abuse his little brother. I mean, you know, he, he would see him crawling along. He would step on the bottom of his pajamas and trip him up and fall. And he'd do all kinds of things to his little brother, <clears throat> and, and I took him aside, and I said, Patrick, do you know what your name means? Do you know why I chose your name? You know, Patrick Stephen, I told him Stephen's story, and, and I said, listen, uh, you are a wise counselor. You ought to be the person who helps. Your name speaks to someone that does nothing but help people and build them up, and look what you're doing to your little brother. Instead of, of helping him along, you're tripping him up and being a stumbling block. And he apologized. And it wasn't very long until he saw his brother struggling with something and he ran over and said, Philip, let me, let me help you. And he went, it, it changed his whole attitude because he just, just took the time to explain to him a different side. Words are very important. God forbid that we waste words. We want to be able to extend great benefit using words. So, Oops, I guess I should have done that because now it did that. Okay. I put down just a few of the things that come about from good words. Good words can be encouraging. Now I put Obama, Obamaism. I don't think that's a word. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. But you remember when President Obama first ran. Uh, almost 12 years ago now, uh, he had this little slogan, uh, just, it said, yes, we can, right? And, and I, I, I just want to tie into that and say, yes, you can. Sometimes there are people who think to themselves, I can't, I can't, I can't. They have, I can't, itis. it's an infection. It affects their minds and makes their brains feel feeble and they say man I, I, I can't I can't and you know you can just speak a word and say listen yes you can you can do this I was 
talking to a coworker and she was going on about how there's too much month left at the end of the money and, and just, I, I can't do this and I can't. I said, listen, you know, do you live on a budget? She said, budget won't help me. I'm like, well, have you ever tried? No, I just, I just, I don't have enough. And I said, listen, uh, God has promised to make all, to meet all your needs. I said, you just have to be wise in how you approach it. And so one day she came in, she said, okay, here. She had a whole bag. She says, here's my check stub. Here's all my bills. Show me how. I'm like, okay, let's do this. Let's put together a budget. See, some people, it's, it's not that they can't. It's just that they really don't know how. And, you know, you can come along because God has wired you or he's filled you with wisdom. You know, where do I get wisdom from? Wisdom comes from experience. There are some things you've experienced in your life. There's some things you've learned how to do. There's some things that you've gotten over that become monumental achievements that other people think are hills that they can't climb. And you say, no, listen, you can do this. I was in your shoes. In fact, I didn't even have the shoes you have, right? And let me tell you how it was done. Let me show you what God showed me. And because you're able to step with them, then they're able to do it. You can encourage them. You can give them a word. And don't let them give up on themselves. Good words impart strength. But sometimes people, people are weak and they, they, they just they want to give in. They want to give in to temptation. They want to give in to sin. They want to give in to wrong thinking, wrong habit patterns. And, and you come along, you say, hey, listen, that's no, that's not. We can't do that. You don't say, you, you know better than that, because that doesn't help. They already know better. They already feel guilty. Next time, they won't come and tell you. So you just say, listen, we can't do that. You put yourself alongside them, and you say, we can't. Come on. Come on now. You grab by the arm and walk with them away from the dangerous thing. I say, no, 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 no. Come on, we, we, we need to do this. You carry them away from danger. You may have to do that two, three, four, five times. But is it worth it to save a life? Absolutely. There is a song that the Frey put out years ago, How to Save a Life. And that, that song was actually about suicide because teen suicide is, is just rampant in our society, in our world. And, and the writer of the song, he used to volunteer at a clinic for teens. And he saw how many teens were prone to suicide. He wrote that song, thinking about that. I would have stayed up with you all night if I had known how to save a life. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Because every life is precious. And God has stored up in you the words that will give strength to people who are about to give up. Third thing, uh, and I think about this a lot. You think about the word grace. It ministers grace. Grace is undeserved kindness, right? You know what grace is all about? And so when people are mean to you, when people are unkind, <clears throat> when people are vitriolic, when and people do things to spite you, to hurt you, to cut you off, to hem you in, to do you dastardly, when people do those, they are expecting you to get them back. But oh, no, you don't. You return kindness. Isn't that what God does? Listen, the scripture says that you have made yourself the enemy of God. You were going away and you turned your back. You weren't about to give God any play in your life. So what did he do? He chased you down. He knocked you down. He tied you down. He preached the gospel to you. He changed your heart. He saved you. And then he lifted you up and delivered you from so great a death. And it, it, isn't it true that the scripture says it's the goodness of God? that leads you to repentance. You don't fight fire with fire, as Dr. King says. You have to fight fire with water. You, you don't fight hatred with hatred. You fight hatred with love, see? You fight enmity with peace. You don't do tit for tat. You return grace, kindness, undeserved kindness. You say, well, they don't deserve anything. Neither did you. 
But that didn't stop God from loving you. And as you're made in his image, you ought to be like him. You've got his blood coursing through your veins. You ought to think like the master. Think like your father. Return undeserved kindness. And use words that will communicate that in such a way that it will actually lift the person up. And then finally, what you'll find, I put that at the bottom and, and made it a uh, reverse video so it will stand out. When you do these things, it opens up an opportunity for the gospel. God will use your kindness to open a heart toward Christ. God will use your encouragement to open a heart toward Christ. God will use the fact that you didn't give them what they expected you gave them something other than, and it opens their heart to a Christ. Let me give you, well, we, we're, man, we have less than five minutes. I'm going to do this really fast. Go to that last slide because I want to give you just four quick um, principles of application. In order to be an approved workman, we always try to end with that. Uh, four quick things. Number one, respect the power of the word, right? I said remove the bullets because you have to understand words are powerful and words can wound if not kill people. And so, you know, nobody in their right mind would take a loaded gun and leave it out on the table where kids are playing. That would be stupid, right? But we, we don't want to do that with words either. We don't want to leave words lying around that Satan can use to crush people. Take the bullets out of the gun. Decide, I am not going to say the thing that will bring harm, right? Second, join the Good Report Club, right? Only speak the things that are good report. I told you before, my friend Michael Benton and I, we had a Good Report Club, and just he and I, we vowed that we would only speak well of other people. And if we were in each other's presence and we said something, negative, that was not a good report. We said, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we would immediately stop, bow our heads, and ask God's forgiveness. And you say, well, it's silly. Well, yeah. But then one day we were on the elevator going down in the department store, and I was talking. I said something about a guy. He said, oh, Ray, that's a bad report. And he's looking at me. I see I'm the one discipling him. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. So in that crowded elevator full of people, I bowed my head and I said, Lord, please forgive me. <laughs> Talk about humbling. <laughs> but you know, I mean, you do it. You say, it's, it's not a game. No, it's not a game. But just that one experience, just, I said, man, I don't ever want to be in that situation again. I'm going to be careful what I say about people. You don't want to be an assassin for the devil going around shooting people, wiping them out in the name of, the, of evil, or even in the name of righteousness, because it's not righteous. You want to walk in love. Number three, learn to do better. Learn to do better. Don't say, it. well, that's just not who I am. Change, right? Don't, don't say I can't, because that's not true. Just tell the truth, say, I don't want to do it. And then confess your sins to the Lord. Say, Lord, the Lord change me. Ladies, y'all took that study, right? Lord, change my heart before it's too late or whatever the name of that book was. Um, change, change something. Change my thinking. Change my mind. Change something before it's too late. Um, but anyway, the ladies studied that uh, in a ladies' Bible. Started on Wednesday night. Maybe you ladies weren't in, in on that. Um, oh, it was Lord, change my attitude before it's too late. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, uh, maybe we need to go through that book again. <laughs> Um, but just, just learn to do better. Just decide that you're not going to be the person that the devil used to kill people. Decide that you're going to be the person that God used to build. And so on. Then finally, finally, listen, trust God to use the words he gave you. Just really, trust God to use you. I put the story of Elijah's, ser uh, Elijah's servant. I want to end with that. Remember, remember the woman that Elisha um, well, she had, she didn't have a child. She built, she and her husband built a little room for him. And, um, she, she said, uh, I think he's a man of God. Let's, let's have a little room for him. So when he travels and Elisha would stay there. And then eventually, um, he says to his servant, what can we do for this woman? 
Uh, and he says, well, she didn't have any children. So Elisha says, this time next year, you're gonna have a child. And that, that next year, she had a son. And then as years went, old, went by, one day the son got sick and he died. And the woman went to Elisha and you know, Elisha sent the servant, but the servant couldn't wake the boy up. But Elisha went and stretched out on the boy and um, breathed into him, prayed over him, prayed over him, et cetera. And the Lord answered Elisha's prayers and brought the boy back to life. And he gave him back to his mother. And she said, now I know that you're a man of God. And the word of God in your mouth is true. Well, years later, Years later, the servant of Elisha, he's standing before the king, and he's just regaling the king with some of the exploits of Elisha. And unbeknownst to any of them, the Shunammite woman had left the area, and now she was back in the area, but she needed to get her land back. And so in order to get the land back, she's coming to the king. And she doesn't know the king. The king doesn't know her from Adam. But all she knows is the only way I can get my land back is, is if the king grants it to me. And so Elisha's servant is regaling the king with the stories of instance in Elisha. He raised this woman's son from the dead. And then he looks up and he says, that's the woman. And the king mesmerized, called her down, and said, tell me the story. And the story is messed. And so then he said, give her back her land. Problem solved. I remember that story. It was just, you say, well, man, she was really lucky. She came on just the right day. Oh, no, no, no. That's a God thing. See, God was the one that knew that the woman needed the king to get redressed, to get her, her land back. And God knew that even though the king didn't know her, the only way that the king would do what needed to be done was to have Elisha's servant right there, right then, saying right what he said so that he could bring the circumstances together. Now listen, God didn't just do that for Elisha's servant so it would make a great Bible story. God says that for your benefit and my benefit. You see, you can trust God. That, that when you speak, when you're talking to people, when you're talking about the things that Jesus Christ has done for you, sharing your testimony, right? You don't have to invent stuff, right? Just tell what God has done. Just be very real. Just be very honest, very open. You can share your struggles. You can share. Uh, I wouldn't go into debt about my sin because that doesn't bless anybody. But the fact that, listen, I used to be down, but I'm not down anymore because God is the one who lifted me up. Listen, as you tell your story, then there are people who will hear your story. There are people who will be impressed by your God. There are people who will be drawn, and God will use your words to accomplish his will, not just in your life, but in the lives of other people around you. That's why you use words carefully, skillfully, cogently. That's why you use words and you become a wordsmith so that you craft just the right words. You throw out words that aren't fitting and you only allow a few words carefully chosen to accomplish the will of God that speak well of his glory and let God use your life. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for allowing us to have a few minutes just to look into your word. 